All right, the next section we're going to cover are on your agenda on page one, numbers eight and nine, which are a couple of the church or charge conference reports that you will fill out. One is the report of the finance committee. The other is the fund balance report. A lot of these just relate to uh, stuff we've already talked about. The report of the finance committee is a charge conference report. It's available on the conference website. And if you go to dscumc.org and you look up across the top, you'll see church forms. Click on there. And it's also available on the GCFA website. It's turned in when you have your charge conference. And it's really a checklist to make sure you've done the stuff that we've already talked about in that guidelines book of the finance committee or in some of the best practices that we had in that best practices checklist or that we had in the back part, one of the appendix, appendices of the um, local church audit guide. So it's just, you know, how are you organized some people's names? Did you develop the budget? How often do you send out your giving statements? How do you handle church funds and report? Do you have the written policies? One of the questions that churches and finance committees may not know is number 13 on page 48 that says, are financial officers of the church bonded? And the answer is yes. Church Mutual, through your liability insurance policy that you have with them, does bond employees and volunteers. The only people who aren't covered are independent contractors. So if you have someone, for example, an accountant that you're paying to do your accounting or bookkeeping each month, they should be maintaining their own liability insurance and you should ask for a certificate of insurance naming your church as an additional insured or at least get a copy of to verify that they have the insurance in place so that if they did something dishonest, you could recover from their insurance carrier. But you can generally answer yes to that question because of the church mutual. It's signed on the bottom of page 48 by the finance committee chair, and it's pretty straightforward. Don't usually get too many questions on that. One of the other financially oriented charge conference reports is the fund balance report that's on pages 49 and 50. This is completed and signed off on by the audit committee which may be a subcommittee of the finance committee or it may be just the finance committee if you don't have a separate audit committee. It's again available on the conference or GCFA website. Key thing to note is that this is not turned in at your charge conference. You wait till after the year is over and then you turn it in in January. So just like you're doing your statistical tables in January, you're filling this form. And it's simply a roll forward. What was the balance in your general fund, any other funds you have, building fund, memorial, gift fund, et cetera. At the beginning of the year, in total, what did you income bring in? What did you spend out? Were there any adjustments or transfers? And what's the ending balance? It's a very summarized report. For example, the general fund probably has a lot of detail that makes up the detail of it, but you would report the totals in here. Depending on how good your software is, it's either easy or it requires a lot of uh, calculating, but the end report is, is pretty straightforward. And then the next page is simply reporting on what the auditor said. Did you get it done? Did they have any comments? What did you do about those comments on the internal controls that they had? And then it's signed by the audit committee. Those are two straightforward, although, can take a little bit of time, charge conference reports. You do not need to send those to me. You send these to the district office and they're compiled with the other charge conference reports that you fill out. There's a little bit of discussion about stewardship. There are plenty of canned stewardship, I don't mean canned in a negative sense, but stewardship programs available through Cokesbury. There are two books though that I wanted to bring to your attention. One is called The Spirituality of Fundraising by Henry Nowen, which is just a very thin little pamphlet 40 pages. It's really based on a speech that he gave way back when in 1992. And the second one is a uh Ask, Thank, Tell, which is written by a Lutheran pastor. It's a little longer, 128 pages. All of the spirituality of fundraising in the first half of Ask, Thank, Tell deal with kind of the mindset, the theory, the theological thinking about it. They aren't step-by-step -step programs on how to do it. Ask, Thank, Tell does get into a little bit of things to consider as you're conducting your campaign but they're not the off-the-shelf campaign programs that you might purchase from Cokesbury. 
but they are helpful in thinking about things. I have done my Cliff's Notes version of both books and provided them for you. Spirituality of Fundraising is on pages 51 to 53. Basically, Henry Nowen tries to get us to think of fundraising as a ministry, that it's a call to conversion not only for those of us who are asked to fundraise, but also the people that do give as a result of that. We're drawn together, collaborating to try to do something new. It's a very concrete way to allow, as the author says, um, the kingdom of God to come about here on earth. He notes that it's tough to talk about money. It's as taboo, if not more so, than any of the other, many of the other social issues. Some people would be just aghast if they had to talk about their own personal finances. But it's interesting, he, he makes the point that personal worth, you could take it two ways. It could be, how much money do you have? But it could also be, what is your value as a human being, which is a much different and probably more important measure. He notes that, what is our security base? All of us w worry about money and wanting to make sure that we have enough to be secure, to provide for ourselves and our families. And so we may try to place our trust in money for financial security and in, in God for other security reasons. And it's just tough, the old, you know, you can't serve two masters. So he encourages us to try to think of money as a supplement to what truly is our security base in, in Jesus. He also makes some interesting points that we need to minister to people who are rich, not because they are rich, not because we want their money, but they are people who have needs as well, and they may be so used to the only thing that people ever bug them about is money and giving. We need to say we love them, we want to be in community with them, not because they have money, but because of who they are as a human being. And if we can do that, if our security base is is in God and not the money, then it kind of frees us up to, to ask. We're not doing this to be punitive. We're giving you, as a person with whom we've est I've established a relationship with, an opportunity to put your resources at the disposal of the kingdom of God. People have a need for friendship and community, and so any fundraising efforts have to be, has to be community building. And that that community is one of the greatest gifts we have to offer. And in exchange, they are able to offer resources, perhaps, that can enable some of our great ministries to get done. He kind of concludes that if we undertake um, fundraising as a ministry grounded in prayer and undertaken in gratitude, grateful that God has given us all we really need and that we're the stewards, then we can live a life of abundance and uh, we can help others do the same. It's a very short 40-page book that you can read in less than an hour, but it's a good thing to think about as we undertake a campaign. Again, it's not going to tell you, take these steps to raise money, but it helps get your mindset going. Ask, Think, Tell has many of the similar comments, but he has some other interesting things. He notes for example, six traits of discipleship. And he includes in that daily prayer, daily scripture reading, weekly worship, growth in giving to tithing or 10% or beyond, serving others in Jesus' name, and then sharing our stories, sharing our faith stories. So only one of those six has to do with money, but it is one. He also notes that everything we have belongs to God. We're not the owners. We're merely the stewards, and because we're not the owners, that the steward's responsibility is to care for the possessions of the owner, God, and for the benefit of the other people who depend on the owner for their well-being. He raises up our, the very familiar verse from Matthew 6, 24, that no one can serve two masters. When we have the wealth, we're tempted to trust in the wealth, but we, again, as did Henry Nowen, need to say, we need to truly trust Jesus to provide all that we need to provide. and. Sometimes that's much easier um, said than done. Another interesting thing he gets into are some portraits of a biblical giver, and he talks about six characteristics of a faithful steward, saying that our giving should be intentional, not, you know, haphazard. It should be regular, just like anything thing that you want to exercise. I mean, we can't go out and run a marathon if we decide we're going to go out and run when the Spirit moves us. That giving needs to be generous, needs to be first, um, proportional. You know, may not be able to be at the tithing 10% level, but if we can increase what proportion of our income each year, then we can truly grow in 
our discipleship. Across the denomination, this is true for mainline de denominations, people give about 2% of their, well, if we could get to everybody tithing and we could get 10%, five times that, we can only imagine what you know, great ministry we could do. And then lastly, he says that giving should be cheerful. If we're, congregations are truly going to embrace giving, the money needs to be open, it needs to be plain, and it needs to be regular. It doesn't mean you have to have sermons every week on money, but you could have the stories of the ministry that are being accomplished, how people's lives have been changed. Some of a little bit of what we tried to emphasize here even is just how your apportionment contributions have helped change lives for people all over the conference, the country, and the world. Then he does get into some a little more hands-on at the end as far as, you know, don't use a budget to raise money. Don't say we <laughs> you need to give because of here's here's what we need to pay for the light bills, etc. Ask for, as we talked about, a little bit of a growth. Forget wherever you're at now, can you bump it up a little bit the next year? That we use what he prefers, estimate of giving cards rather than pledge cards. Because you might might be able to do better. You know, don't don't limit yourself. He has saying plan, conduct, follow up, and thank are his four steps. So that's kind of where he gets his ask, thank, tell. Then he goes into ways to ask people to give. And clearly the one-on-one -on -one relationship from people you know is the most effective down to the least effective of a generic letter sent out to everybody from somebody that finance committee chair that only a certain number of people know. So not again as detailed as many of the programs but some other things to think about similar to the spirituality of fundraising and that because our needs for ministry are never done really the need for stewardship um, is is never done as well. The weekly storytelling or mission moment type of things in worship uh, are effective. So those are a couple of books I commend to you. Just get your mindset around the stewardship, not so much on how to do a campaign, but how to think about giving and how to maybe help um, our fellow parishioners think about giving. The last section is a short one related to a fraud hotline uh, that we have just recently set up. Uh, unfortunately, fraud happens more often than we would want to think in church settings, and we have talked a lot about internal controls that we hope are in place to help prevent or at least timely detect those. But across the country, it's been proving, not just in churches, that the most effective way for detecting fraud is through a tip hotline. Earlier this summer in August, we implemented through fraudhl.com a new tip reporting hotlines. To the best of my knowledge, we haven't had anything pop up yet. Information was sent out to each of the churches. We have these handy dandy little refrigerator magnets and some laminated posters that you can place out. If anybody suspects that something might be going on, them the opportunity to anonymously report. And we have four different lines set up, so we'd go to the appropriate district. The district superintendent would hear about it, so they wouldn't know that it was Jane Doe that said this, but they would know that it relates to First Church of any town, Arizona, and they could appropriately check it out. And it gives you examples of things that you might think are not right if you suspected embezzlement or kickbacks or ethical violations. Note that it doesn't include the pastor's sermon, wasn't very inspiring. It includes any sort of fraud. It also includes um, if you think there's any identity theft, if you think there's any example of potential sexual misconduct. So fraud or, or sexual misconduct are both reportable anonymously. Encourage you to make sure that you have this available that people in your congregation are familiar with it and it gives the 800 or 855 number that you can call. It's a, a fairly recent thing for us and it's in response to just the best practices that we're trying to employ that um, it was spearheaded by one of our district superintendents, Nancy Cushman, and then the research that she did and presented to CFA, it was clear that this was the most effective tool in preventing fraud and, and that, that, that is our goal. So I commend you if you haven't seen it um, and need information on it, can't find it, your pastor doesn't know, let 
Nancy or me know and we can follow up with you. So that wraps up the details that we're going to be covering today. It was pretty fast paced. It wasn't designed to make you an expert. It was designed to get you to think about some things that you hadn't thought about before and where you might go to get some resources. GCFA.org, UMCgiving.org. You have that church and clergy tax guide that I referred you to. Some of the more tax oriented, go to irs.gov. Thank you for the time. I hope that it works out okay doing this via webinar format. It certainly is saving some time and money on your parts and you can look at it when you see fit. If you get nothing else, uh, you get my contact information off of page one and feel free to contact me with any questions or follow-up information that you want. So thank you and we'll talk to you later.